Please, I hope no one is offended. For some examples that I use that people think I'm using because of them or because I get so many comments. I mean, you have to understand that <clears throat> when so many thousands of people are viewing and then so many people are commenting, when the Holy Spirit speaks, you may be thinking, she's talking about me and I'm not. I'm not talking about any particular person because God wants to reach you all. And if you feel that God is using you in any way, be grateful. Be grateful because I will tell you why. Because God is using you to help souls find the truth. And it doesn't matter how he does it. Many times in my life, I have mocked and laughed at myself. I have given testimonies where, I mean, I literally laughed at myself. And, and I would have everybody in the room laughing because it was funny. The way I thought, the way I felt, it was all so funny. And, uh, and although the seriousness of what was going on wasn't funny, but still, we can laugh at ourselves. We can understand. We are all human. None of us is any better than the other. There is no way, and God knows my heart, there's no way I think of myself as better than you or as better than the preachers that I talk about or better than because they need help, just like I did. They're no different than I am. And and people even in, in, in politics, I, I can remember last year, somebody wrote a very unkind, I mean, it was unkind, uh, sent a picture, maybe not even last year, I'd say a couple years ago. M maybe it wasn't even that I'm thinking about. Maybe it was about eight years ago, seven years ago. And somebody put out a very unkind picture. And without thinking, I agreed with it. And I had to go back and to those people, no matter how much I disliked them, how much I was positive they were wrong positive, I had to go back and say, I am sorry for my unkindness. You know, there was somebody that, that has been so cruel and mean to others. And just recently I put out a comment and I did not intend it to be mean, but I intended to try to draw attention to the fact that something was wrong with this woman so that people would not be persuaded by her and instantly take her as though she is something. Unfortunately, when you do try to make something right, you give the wrong impression. And like I told you, there are people who look at someone else and they are so wrong that other someone else that they are positive, they are right. And they develop this and they grow like this until they get to a place where they, they become like a God, that they know everything, they understand everything, and and uh, there's no way you can tell them anything. And you can see the difference is they, they will do things that are so ungodly. And I don't want to become like that. And because I don't want to become like that, I will back up. I will stop and say, that I'm sorry if, if I hurt your feelings, or I'm sorry that I hurt your feelings, uh, because I know that was wrong. So that's what we all must do, all of us, not just me, not just them, not just you. Now, there's a lot of what they call memes out there, uh, making fun of people. Some of that comedy is very, very funny. But as you go on into life, there's some of it I won't even look at. I won't even think about it. Because some of it, there was a day when I was a child and I was growing up. And I was like a teenager. In the back of magazines, you could see in a little corner about this big, a picture. And that picture underneath it, and it was a slightly, just slightly dirty joke. It was intended to be dirty, so therefore it was hidden way back in the back of the magazine. And so as I got older, uh, then they started coming out with 
comedians that felt the only way they could uh, get laughter is if they were filthy. And so as they become darker and darker with filth, people literally in this culture, in going to church and loving God, would enjoy them and would laugh with them because it, it, it and it was filthy. It was dirty, rotten, and filthy. And some of you had to discern for yourself where you draw the line. Because as a Christian, I mean, there's times where the joy of my heart is so full. And because it's coming up to my, my uh, birthday, I remember one particular instance where a beautiful group of Mexican people came to my home to pick me up and take me to Sarasota, uh, where I live in Palmetto, so Sarasota is pretty far away, and took me to a re Mexican restaurant. And they figured since my father was Mexican, I would really enjoy it. And they were right. And on the way up the whole time, because it took a while to get there, the whole time, we were just laughing. And I mean, your sides would split. You laughed so hard at some of the things that were so funny about ourselves. Not about anybody else. Not about any dirt or filth. But just about life. And we would just begin to giggle and laugh. And laughter is contagious. Okay. And we would laugh. And we laughed the whole trip up. And... These people said, Mariana, I didn't know you were like that. I didn't know that we could have so much fun with you because they felt that my, my, uh, my messages were always so serious because to me they were a, a matter of life and death. Uh, they were a matter of life and death for their children. They only saw me in the messages that God would give me, which would be a warning to. But there would also be a peace and a joy. But it wasn't the same as the laughter. And so when we got to the restaurant, and I will never forget these people. They were very kind and very good to me. And we just had so much fun. And as we sat there, and you know the mariachi band comes out and starts to sing in, uh, in Spanish, happy birthday to you. I mean, it was just fun. And all the way back up until the time we got to the edge of my property, I mean, it was full, blown out laughter and fun. And I really believe what God is saying is you don't have to listen to a comedian that compromises their soul and thinks that the only way you could get laughter is by telling filthy jokes or worse than some filthy jokes. It would be where they are cutting and tearing someone and ripping them apart. It's one thing to rip apart of somebody that you know is really, really wrong and needs to wake up. But to, to do it with somebody that doesn't need that, that has not done anything to, to deserve it, that's, that's entirely different. But one is no different than the other. Because if you do it to one, there's no difference between you and, and the others that are doing it. So what we have to do is we have to separate ourselves from it. I know that right now online that there is a young man that oh, I dearly love him. I really, really do. He is so expressive in what he watches, but he has allowed himself to be, become filthy, to use four-letter words, to do things. And I, I straight out told him, I quit watching him. I can't watch it because it's wrong. And as much as gifted as he is, he doesn't have to get attention to stoop to that. That's not how God sees you. God would have given him. It's like, it's like lying. It was like when a, a person came up to me and said, please pray for me. I, I want to get this house and I can't get it unless I lie. And I told him, there is no time in your life that you ever have to lie. Ever. Not even a tiny, tiny lie. No matter how little you think it is. Don't lie. And I promise you, you will get your property. 
Well, they came back and they didn't lie and they got their property. Understand, you don't have to compromise to be accepted. You don't have to go into, into churches and compromise with other people in order for them to, to you, you don't speak up and say, well, that's gossip. That's wrong. I don't want to hear it. You don't speak up. You just sit there and let them do it. You don't take a stand and say, I don't want to do parts of this. I'm not going to do this. And even as I have done some of these videos, and, and I, I know that I've lived a long life of, uh, of holiness, but that doesn't mean I don't make mistakes. And this is what you must understand. I'm a human being. I'm just like you. I make as many mistakes as you can make. And I've always taught you that if someone says something bad about you, make sure it's a lie. And the, uh, because the only way that you could keep what God has given you is if you do make an ignorant mistake, a stupid mistake, you always go back and make it right. You always go back and say, I, I, you know, I never should have said that. And I've done it over and over because it's too easy to get caught up with feeling bad that, that the children are suffering, that the, uh, that what they're doing with gender, it's too easy to, put others down. It's too easy to do that. When we have to climb up on the backs of other people, our thinking is wrong. I don't have to use another back to climb up. But that's not the same thing as telling the truth about that individual. If that individual is doing wrong, and God whispers it to me and tells me, point that out, I'm going to point it out to do what God called me to do because he gave me the light so that I could expose it because whatever makes manifest is light but what we as Christians need to do is we need to allow God to draw the line for us we need to allow God to show us the and reveal to us the line of demarcation there is a line that you don't ever cross and even the most sincere, the most holy, the most faithful person, as long as they are ex existing in the flesh on this earth, can be tempted in the wrong direction, even on things that don't seem to mean anything. And this is where I'm trying to tell you not to condemn yourself. If you feel something that you have done or said is wrong, go back and make it right. Just go back and do it right. Now, on my channel, I have had people who are of a, uh, a certain way of thinking. And so they start and strike up a conversation among themselves so that they could bring it out uh, according to the scriptures that whatever they are doing wrong, they have the scripture that tells you they're right. When common sense will tell you they're not right. And so I stand up and say, hey, this is my channel. I'm going to re remove it every time because I don't fight, bite, or debate. I will not debate the word of God. I will not give you a platform to speak your mind and, and put me on the spot or someone else on the spot because it was among themselves too. To put someone else on the spot, they have to answer. Don't do it. If you have an encouraging word to say and you receive something from God, that's fine. If you don't agree, leave me alone. For the scripture says that if you see someone doing good in my name, leave them alone. Because the disciples went up to him and said, hey, you know, they're over there doing this, this, and this in your name. And he says, there is nobody who can use my name like that, that they can speak evil of me so easily. And so leave them alone. If they're doing good, leave them alone. So if you see that souls are repenting and souls are changing and souls are getting, getting deeper and closer with God, it is to your advantage to just leave me alone. Now, I don't pick out particular 
ministries. I don't pick out particular doctrines. I, I do have God will come and tell me that certain things are wrong and I, I will speak about them because he gave them to me. But understand, we do not want to become equal with someone who is doing wrong. The word of God says, overcome evil with good. How do you overcome evil with good? And, and you do it by love. You do it by making a decision that no one deserves what is being done to them. Most people, they literally sit down and say, well, she got what she deserves or he got what he deserves. No, no one deserves evil. Sometimes it leads them to repentance. Sometimes it doesn't. But no one deserves to be treated evilly. So we can't say that. You know, I'm, I'm in a place right now where I still check myself and, and still watch over my soul to make sure I don't do certain things. And if at any time you think, well, you know, like one man wrote to me and he said that uh, he really checked me out. And because I supported so and so and I support, he, he wasn't going to follow me. Well, that, that's fine. What he didn't know was is I didn't support so-and-so, and I didn't approve of so-and-so. I may have commented at one time, but that didn't mean I supported them and approved of them. That, that it only means that the agape love, the love of God was there to listen to what they had to say, to say enough to allow them to hear the truth. Because if the, it's the truth that sets you free, it's not, it's not Marion Lynch. It's not anything I've said or done. It's the truth. And when God spoke the truth, the truth set people free. And that freedom of truth lasts throughout eternity. You see, once the truth goes out into the air, it has the power when it is spoken from a pure, clean heart. It has the power to break every bondage in that life that God spoke the truth to. Now, if that truth comes out of a, a double-minded person, or if it comes out of somebody who has truly evil in their heart, or it has self-gain, self-everything in their heart, what comes out might sound like the truth and might even be a repetition of the truth, but it doesn't have the power of the truth that will stay with that soul and cut to the bone and marrow. And this is the whole purpose. I mean, one of what I, I could say one. This is one of the whole purposes of cleaning out your heart and making sure that what you say and do comes from God, not from you. It's not so that you could be better and be one up on your neighbor and be one up on the person in church that you think that you're so much better than. That's not what this is all about. This is about getting close enough to God that you may be able to reach anybody rather than see souls never find God because the stumbling blocks are in the way. If your heart is not crying because the Bible says, where is the crier? If your, if your heart does not cry for the unborn, cry for the babies that are being raped and murdered. Cry for the wives that are being abused by tyrants and dictators. If it does not cry, and I know you can find it on, speaking of husbands that are dictators, you can find on YouTube or anywhere else and call this certain kind of man a narcissist. It, you can do that, and it might even look like it fits. But sometimes, because that man was raised a certain way, he can't even see God. He can't even see the truth. And he becomes a victim of his whole life just the way you are. But because you're so spiritual and you're so right, you do, you do what they do. You do what men do. As a woman, you separate yourself and you go into your prayer closet and you think, 
God's going to hear you because you're suffering so bad under this certain individual. And, and he's so wrong. And this is where you begin to think because that person is so wrong. You gotta be right. So God's gotta be on your side. And God is going to move that man. God is going to move that woman. And you're, you're just a little bit right. God wants to move them, but he's not going to move them for you. He's not going to do one thing with them for you. You know why? Because you're not completely right. If you were completely right, you would be looking at that other person as a wounded part of your right arm that's wounded, that is not capable of doing what it needs to do. Because the Bible says to become one and they are, that's your other half. And what are you doing separating from it? So you take this arm and cut it off and shove it over there and leave it lay there and let it rot. And then you go over here and you pray to God. Well, this arm did this and this arm said that and this. Don't you see how ignorant that is? Don't you see what God sees when he had it planned for you to be used of God, to love him enough to grab a hold of that arm and begin to pray for it, to begin to pray for life to come into it, to bind the power of Satan, to destroy it completely. For God does not will, for in the end, he does not split up magic marriages so that one goes in the grave and into hell and the other one goes into heaven. That's not him. If you are positive, you are so right that that other one is so wrong. Many a time, there are men in this life that have never been taught love. They've never been taught respect. They've had mean, cruel dads. They've had everything mean and cruel in their life. They've had ignorant mothers that, that didn't know how to treat them or talk to them. And they became a victim. And, and so their lack of respect their lack of understanding got all wrapped up in the appearance of seeming like they are a narcissist. And you will find that the uh, teachings of the world, oh, they pick out this, this is what this is. At. If I would take the study of psychology, I could apply it to every single person I ministered to. I could apply it and that would be that. Would be that. God said, no. I'm the one that knows the heart. It's not the combination of this working with this. It's not the combination of studying the demons that this one does this and that one does that. And they, that's not what it's about. What it is about is the individual making wrong choices. And then you have to ask yourself, Lord, you go before God and say, Lord, why are they so impossible to heal? And many times you can find out that you're standing in the way. And so you have to go before God and say, Lord, where is my part in this? What have I done and said to feed this? Because oftentimes when you're positive that they will never find God, they are positive you never will. Listen to what I'm telling you. Satan comes along and he speaks to two. He tempts one and he tempts the other. And the two people that are involved there are tempted according to the, uh, what do you call, according to the tendencies that they have, according to their weaknesses. So this one takes exactly the same thing you're thinking and believing. Because you're looking at him, hating his guts, hating what he does. And he's turning around looking at you, hating your guts, hating what you do. You get it right back. So then you have a home like this at one another all the time, fighting, bickering, arguing. And then you draw away and you go before God and you blame it all on him. Because see, you go to church because you read your Bible. Oh, because you pray. That makes you better. Somehow that makes you a Christian. Whether you're a man or a woman, this is your attitude toward your spouse. These are the kind of things that you do not realizing that he literally reflects who and what you are. Mix it with what has happened to him from the time he was a child. He can't find God because you know what? He looks at you and he says, why? 
She's so holy. I can't ever be like that. I can't ever live like that. And you're sitting there looking at him saying, you can't become like me. You never will. You, you'll never, you'll never walk and talk and act like I do in Christ because I got it all. I know what I am. You know nothing. So all the while you're puffing up because of what you know, get the words K-N-O-W, know, knowledge puffeth up. So while you're puffed up, you are looking down on that person, whether it's a man or a woman, a husband or a wife, it doesn't matter. You're looking down on them. When that person Maybe it's all they can do to struggle to get their head above water where they could see even a little bit because they can't see past the stumbling block that you have allowed yourself to become. So who is the who that has to repent? And I'm, I'm going to tell you how I came to the place of understanding because somebody asked me, what? What did I do when I was younger? How how did I overcome certain things? Well, when I was younger, I can remember, and God must have, he must have a, a good sense of humor. Because I can remember being sworn at. And I was getting fed up with it. I mean, I just got to a place where I'm not taking this no more. This is going to stop. God has to, just has to do something. So I went before God in my prayer closet. And I believe that God was going to move that man because he had no business doing that. And even though I saw signs that the man was trying to change, I ignored them because he still wasn't doing what I thought he should do. And I thought he should take a bite out of the whole pie the way I had to. And I thought that, that I had to go through my uh, spankings He's got to go through his. And I'm going to tell you this. You're going to think this sounds crazy, but this happened to me. And I went before God and I cried. And I said, told God, I, I can't take it anymore. This constant swearing at me, this constant treating me this way. And this was probably about 20 years ago. Anyway, maybe even longer. Maybe shorter. I don't know because so many things have happened. I just don't have that timeline anymore. And so when I went to God in my prayer closet, positive that he was so bad and so wrong, I had to be right. And I'm going to tell you what God said to me. God said, Marion, what are you upset about? I looked at God like, are you blind? You can't see. I mean, that was my attitude towards God. That's how much of control I had. That's how much controlling in my thinking and my feelings I was. And uh, and it was like, how could you say that to me? You know how the disciples, when he said, who touched me? The disciples says, how could you say that? We're being thrown. Well, I said this to, to Jesus. I said, how could you say that to me? He's the one swearing, not me. And the Lord said to me, haven't you noticed a change in him? And then I realized, yes, I have. And God says, Marion, the man will never be like you. I even had a video on it that they can never be like you. That's the title of it. That God says they could never be like you. And God says, from being a victim of his mother and his father and everything that happened to him in life. He was as much a victim in a different way as you were. And you suffered many things, but so did he. And he has no ability to be anything like you, and he never will. He will never be as spiritual as you are and understanding as you are. But I want you to know something, Marion. I'm well pleased with him. And I'm flabbergasted by now. And I'm going, how could you say that? He's the one that's swearing. He's the one that's doing. How, how could you be pleased with such a man? And here's what God said to me. Marion, this man inside of him, because of all that happened to him, can only give me this much of him. This much. And he is striving to give me this much. That is 
all he has. And because it's all he has, even though you can give this much, you cannot compare yourselves. He cannot ever be like you. You have to accept him the way I accept him. This is what God told me. So you will be more pleased and do what is right in my sight to understand why. This is the best he got, and he gave it to me. And it was as hard for him to obtain that much as it was for you to get this much. So how can I be, if I was displeased with him, I'd have to be displeased with you. I'm no respecter of persons. I'm not going to do that. So what I want you to do is I want you to love him and accept him as he is and give me the power to heal him the way I did you. Because he may never be like you, but he still can be the best he can be in him. Was that an eye opener? Because most of us who get married, most of us are always trying to change that other one. Most of us, because we're so selfish in the flesh, we want we will literally run. Some of us will literally run to be more spiritual and, and, and get in that prayer closet and think it's our haven of rest and our haven of safety when we're deserting that right arm and we're, we're pushing it out and shoving it out because it's not doing what we think it should be doing. And so some of us are so ignorant on that that they just cut it right off. Now ask yourself a question. Without part of your body and you cut it off and you put a prosthetic arm there, it'll never be the same. It'll never replace it because God intended that right arm to be healed. God intended to take it and put it in his arms and rub it and nurse it and nurture it with love. You know, it's your own body. And nobody ever hated their own body. And so what you do is, and it's the same thing with a man with a woman. That's why the word of God says, man must love his wife like he does his own body. But if the man can't get his way, he can't convince her. Say she has a deep conviction there are certain things in the bedroom that she will never do. And he can't get her like that because he lusts after what is unnatural. So what will he do? He'll up and leave her. He will literally up and leave her because he's positive. He's the only one that has to do. Hey, God made him a man. God made him the head and she's not obedient. So she don't deserve to live with me because I am everything before God. When God allowed those two to be together and he was supposed to claim the highest, he was the highest. And because he was the highest, it's so what God would come to me and they'd say, Marion, you're the one most responsible. You claim that you know this, this, and this. How come you don't know his need? How come you don't understand what I'm telling you? So when this man goes like this and he finally gets fed up with his wife and pushes her out of his life and remarries another, why do you think God had these things in the word not to do? He says, if you separate, don't remarry. Why do you think? Because he knows, he understands what happens in human nature. And you now I'm not condemning people who have gotten a divorce. There are some people that can't get this far because maybe their spouse beats them. And verbal abuse is far worse than beating. Believe me, I've been through both. I've been through the one that just went like this, bam, in my face. And I mean, hit me till I'd roll this way and hit me till I'd roll that way until I'd be out of it and fall down, slide down the wall. And then somebody would have to pick me up and lock me in a room so he didn't kill me. I've been through that. And when it, that happened to me, it felt like somebody did this. And that because everything went numb. And that was God's protection on me. 
I didn't feel the beating. God's hand, the moment the hand hit me, God's hand intervened. Because he knew I didn't deserve that beating. You see, well, a lot of people get it and they don't do it because they don't know. They don't know how to pray. They don't know how to break past curse curses. They don't know that what their mothers went through. They don't have to. They've never got into the word to find that out. They've gone everywhere else, even to other pastors, to sit and minister to them, even to psychologists and psychiatrists who can't help them. Even to therapists who can't help because they would not go before God. And here, he taught me. And what I found out is true, that the, ver the, the physical abuse for me was better because when he hit me, he was done for a while. He wasn't, he wasn't going to go into a rage like until the next time. Okay. When I got older before I used to did, do it, everything to get out of it was self preservation, everything to get out of it. And then when I got older, I realized that he had certain seasons. And that were certain triggers that you didn't push. And, and by the time I realized that he was getting worse and worse, and I realized that the next time he hit me, I knew he was going to kill me. And so when I saw him go into his last rage, uh, we had long steps of maybe 17 steps that had a tiny foyer that went out into the front door. And so when I seen him come and I ran as fast as I could down those steps barefoot and I could feel his fingers on my back, just brush my back like that because he hoped to pull my blouse off because if he pulled my blouse off, he knew me. He knew I would never go outside for anybody to see me. He knew that I would never show my body to anybody. He understood that. So that's where when I felt that right across my back, and I leaned on that door. I knew, and I was not a Christian, but I've been right on a lot of things when it comes to that. I knew I was a dead woman if I did not get out of that house. And when I left that house, it was the next night. It was the first night I ever got drunk in my life. And I got drunk and looked him straight in the eye after I packed and dared him to kill me. And he was crying because he didn't want me to go. He couldn't control his rage. But I left. And when I left, I met my husband, who at that time was a hopeless alcoholic. There's more to that story because my life was filled with a lot of things like this. A lot of things of near death from the time I was little. So what I'm saying to you is this. The verbal abuse never stopped. It was a constant. Mm, 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 mm. Constant. You know, good. You can, I've seen it done to my brother. I've seen him told over and over, you'll never be any good. You never not until he never became any good. And he was never nothing. So the verbal abuse is much worse than the beatings. I've seen my own brother take both. I've seen my own nephews take both and go through the same things till they never became anything. So I'm saying to you to understand, you could sit in judgment. I mean, I, I have heard of a preacher who was supposed to be very wise and he could look at the camera and say, I have no respect for any of you women that take abuse. You know, by the time you're five years old and you watch your father knock down your mother and beat on her in front of you, you in your heart become a murderer because you begin to hate him so bad that you want to kill him. And I always say that my dad's rage made me a murderer in my heart until I found Jesus that forgave him. And that was easy to do. But I'm, I'm saying that if you were raised like that, this is how an abused child is raised. There's no way out. 
There is no path you can take. There is no escape. The only thing you know is the abuse. abuse. The only thing you understand when you look at others, for some reason, they're, you look at them and it doesn't occur to you that that's not happening to them. You've got to understand all of these people, these children that are going through these things right now need you. They need you to pray right now. And you're locked up. You're locked up not using the Holy Spirit because you don't know how. You're locked up in a prison of your mind of selfishness and wanting more for you than wanting more of God. You're locked up in wanting entertainment. You're locked up in wanting to look better. You're locked up in wanting to do better. You're locked up in all of these things. You're preoccupied with these babies. And that's why I say a curse was broken when Roe versus Wade was broken. Because the higher ups, they were busy locking everything up for themselves. Making people who were lesser, that couldn't preach, feel like they were just garbage as slaves. Now, you may say, well, my pastor never did. Maybe he didn't. But I know the ones that I met did. Somebody will say, well, I never knew of a pastor that ever did such a thing. Well, maybe you didn't. Maybe you know of a handful that didn't. But I can tell you of whole counties that did it. Whole counties where they all gathered together and they prayed together. They are the man. Everything. How many women were being destroyed? How many children were being destroyed? How many women pastors have destroyed their own children? And yet they, they're playing with souls that, uh, well, we went over here and we're a missionary over here. And we went over and worked with these children. We Hypocrisy. So great. Where do you think it started? It started in the church. And that's why God says that judgment begins in the house of God. And if it's first, it begins at us. Where? With us. Where will the sinner and the ungodly appear? We always have to be aware of that. He says, no, pray that you're not, many of you be masters. Many of you be preachers or teachers because there's a, greater responsibility with that there's a greater you have you have to take care of everything and so there you are you haven't even seen these things to help your own marriage to help your own child and you're out there preaching and teaching according to the word of what they must do in their marriage what they must do it but you don't live it you don't live it so where are you really? What are you really doing? Who are you really? So God, as he chose the foolishness of preaching, he took what is the, almost like dirt to you. It's a woman. He took a woman and gave her the truth. And you look at her and you, I'll never listen to her. She's a woman. And God said, I'm head. God said, everything has to be in order. Everything has to go this way. But did you weigh the way to your mar ma matters? Your protocol that you think is so great, God gave it to you. But that you're dying all around you. There's children being raped and murdered all around you. And you're making more money and you're bringing in more. Oh, what are you doing with these souls? Are you teaching them how to live? Are you teaching them how to go before God with all of their heart and make sure they clean out so much that they could be used to help another soul get up? Is that what you're doing? Oh, well, we take them and we pray and we saturate them in God. If you didn't teach them how to stay saturated, how to keep their garments clean, if you didn't teach them and you only used it as some kind of magic word that is spoken over them, you need another dip with God. 
If any of these words that I've given you convict you, go before God, not me. I'm nobody. I'm nothing. I am nothing but a woman. To you, that should mean something. I am nothing but a woman. I don't say that to you with bitterness. Because you haven't hurt me a bit. None of you at any time, any place, anywhere have hurt. Not my body, not my mind, not my spirit, nothing. And the only heartbreaking thing is, there's many out there that you're hurting. Many can't see the truth because you have become a stumbling buck to them. That is where the pain comes from. That's where I shed tears. That's where you'll see me get on a video and cry. Not for myself. I'm already, <laughs> I already have the victory. I've got the devil kicked out. He can play his games all he wants and it doesn't do him a bit of good. Somebody said, well, you're feisty. That's because inside of me is Jesus Christ. And you know how Jesus Christ feet, treats the devil? Get out! Don't you dare touch my child. Get out of here. When he hollered for Lazarus to come forth, he didn't say, Lazarus, come forth. He said, Lazarus, come forth. Up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph o'er his foes. He arose a victory over the dark domain. Now, how does he do that in you if you still hang on to the devil? If you still hang on to unrighteousness, unholiness, and the evil of letting those around you die because you want to be seen, you want to be something. I said it in Hear God's Thunder. Churches on this block, this block, this block, and this block. All around those little girls that were being raped daily. Daily. They would be forced into submission by a dirty, filthy, rotten man. And none of you, oh, you went to church every Sunday and you praised the Lord and you just love him and you had no idea what was happening to those babies as they went for years locked up. And you think that God is not going to visit that? You think that God isn't going to come to you and tell you? Why were you as a church not in a place that you couldn't hear what was going on? That you couldn't see what was going on? That you couldn't pray? Like I said before, if I went anywhere, God would, he would keep me awake. I couldn't sleep. I had to pray. I would see the demonic forces. Even now, even now, in the whole area, I could see them. I could feel them. And I, I rebuke them. Is that what you do? Or are you so busy fighting for your own, fighting for what you want, fighting for what you think? Are you tangled up in you? These messages aren't for everybody because I know there are mature Christians out there that really, truly love God and they would die before they would do anything to offend him and they would stay in tune with God. They just may not know how because no one ever taught them. But that doesn't mean God holds what they don't know against them for his God will not hold what a person doesn't know about that Bible against them. And that's what I'm trying to explain to you. When you see somebody deep in sin, and it's a sin that you have been taught to hate, you have been taught that is so horrible, and you have judged them to be worthy of death, God help you. Because if you can judge another person to be worthy of death, and you haven't cleaned out your own heart, guess who's worthy of death? Like I said, when you pray the fear of God on somebody, the first place the fear of God is going to come is on you. When you pray for somebody to be dealt with, the first thing that's going to happen to you is you. First thing guaranteed. First thing. That's why he says, mind your own business. Look straight ahead. 
Don't let your right hand know what your left hand's doing. Don't ever sit down and say, well, I've got it all. I know. Look, I finally made it. I understand. No, 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 no. Uh Uh-uh. When God gives you that power to understand you have it all under the blood, it is not for you to get up and go correct everybody under the sun. Because once you do that, you might as well crawl back into the womb because you're not reborn yet. Because you still have a bad attitude and a bad heart. And you'll have to cry out to God, create in me a clean heart and a right spirit. Because all that I have ever done has never been against anyone but you, Lord. My sins are against you. As Paul the Apostle says, whether we believe or don't believe, it is unto God. Whether we do or we don't do, it's up to God. Whether we eat or we don't eat, it's up to God. So he says, don't let anybody judge you in what you wear, what you eat, what you drink. They have no right to. Nobody has a right to judge what belongs to another man. And since you did not die for me, since you did not hold my hand through all of those things that God pulled me through, guess what? You are going to answer by going through the same things until you realize you do not have God with you, until you repent of believing that he put you in charge when what you did was took his place and took charge because you would never clean out your heart because you figured that all you had to do was fast and pray for six weeks, even eight weeks. Hey, that gives you, that gives you the anointing. That gi- Well, you know what? I'm not going to deny the anointing in you. In my book, it talks about there's a difference between the anointing and the man, the anointing and the woman. I'm a woman of God and I'm anointed, but I am capable of making mistakes at times. But I know where God is with me. And so what I do when I'm is I back up and I change. And if somebody would ever have come to me and convinced me that what God taught me is untrue, <laughs> it just won't work. It just won't work because I know there is no man or no woman in Christ Jesus. He does not see gender, no matter how you slice it. He does not see gender. He would never have said that he made them male and female, made he them. And he called them Adam, making her equal to Adam. So you can separate it all you want for your male chauvinism but I've got a book that I've been working on about the macho man of the world coming into the church and using all of those principles the man who is in false doctrine who treats their wife like a slave is no different than the one that has the doctrine that treats their wife like a slave they're only good to be used in bed they're only good to be used in the kitchen and that's it they don't have a mind they don't have anything i got news for you women are equal in the sight of god they came out of man the fact that they came out of man proves they're equal it doesn't prove that he's better he's above he came first oh i i know that it says that i know that people say that but it's it's been misused it's been abused And I'm not even going to discuss the point. I'm only going to discuss the point of what you need to repent of 